Welcome back to day two of the Two Minute Drill Preseason Podcast. We are talking about quarterbacks this week, and today we are talking about the ACC. May not go as long as the SEC quarterback talk yesterday, just because, you know, there, there was a little bit more juice when it came to that conference, but still there's plenty of talented passers in this conference, and we'll include Notre Dame as well. So we're excited to talk about Riley Leonard later on, but we're going to start things off alphabetically like we always do. But before we start anything, Jack, how are you doing today? Doing good. No complaints. How are you? Doing pretty well. You know, the QB grind continues, and I'm excited to get started on it. Absolutely. So we're going to start off with Boston College, Thomas Castellanos, quarterback. He, he kind of stepped in middle of the year a little bit, and he took over as, as this kind of mobile, nimble QB. I feel like early on in the year, you know, you could tell this was a guy that was very much an athlete playing QB. He ran around a lot. He made some nice plays, but it was a lot of running success that kind of built up this team. But as the year went on, you know, we started to see some glimpses and growth as a passer to combine with that athletic ability that I think makes him really exciting. I'm not necessarily buying into him as a draft prospect strictly, but I do think Boston College is in for a surprising year just because of how much I like Castellanos as a like centerpiece for this offense. I think the team is going to show some nice growth some improvement in terms of just the efficiency from play to play. I think the team's going to be in a lot of games, especially when, you know, someone like Florida state who maybe could have their sleepwalking games, a team like Boston college is going to be one where they're going to be in for a lot of trap contests where Boston college comes in as the underdog and makes it a lot tighter of a game than people expected. And it's going to be because of Castellanos. What did you think of your watch on him? And especially what did you think of him as an NFL draft prospect? Yeah, I, I agree with your analysis of Boston College. I think when you have these sort of guys who can do that much with their legs, you know, they're always a threat to kind of just win a game when you can put up 150 on the yard or on the ground or something like that. Um, I, like, I agree he's more of just an athlete playing quarterback. I don't think he's really got got the the passing ability to to really move me as an NFL prospect. You know, the anticipation's not really there. He's just not really that nuanced of a passer, I felt like. You know, he can do some underneath and, and intermediate stuff, but there's not really much of a downfield threat. Um, you know, the arm is 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 okay. It's not it's not mind-blowing, and the accuracy is definitely not there. So I think he's more of a just a good college quarterback at this stage uh, or like a decent college quarterback at this stage. I think he could become a very good college quarterback. Um, these dual-threat guys, you know, they can always they can always win some games, like I said. But I think looking as an NFL lens, I'm not super optimistic in him being more than like a priority free agent type of guy. He's also pretty undersized, which when you're not a great passer and you're also undersized, there's a lot to be nervous about, I, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I think sitting in the pocket is going to be a big thing for him. And yeah. part of that for Boston College, there's not really a reason to make him kind of stay in structure. But I want to see that in terms of buying into him as a prospect, because right now, a lot of it is based on what can he do with his legs to set up the play. But what can he do when he's forced to kind of stay in, make the reads, let the play progress, and then make the throw? And I want to see that from him. I'm not sure if we see it. I'm not sure if it's going to be a part of his game because Boston College is going to be relying on him heavily. And I think when you're a team that's sort of centered around one guy and maybe the supporting cast isn't as talented as most of your opponents – it becomes a lot of hero ball type moments where you're scrambling around in the backfield, trying to buy time, trying to make plays. And that's not really going to be your game at the NFL level. Obviously there's guys like Mahomes and Kyler Murray who can make those plays happen. And Castellanos is an athlete enough to make that happen, but I don't know if it's enough to kind of sell himself as his NFL quarterback. Yeah, completely agreed. Moving on to California, they're bringing in North Texas transfer Chandler Rogers. This was an interesting transfer situation because I thought they had a pretty solid quarterback situation already with their young guy standing in. But Rodgers, you know, at North Texas, I, I went to North Texas, so I was watching a little bit more of their games through the season, and a lot of it was this team was kind of shaky all year, and then Rodgers took over the starting job, and they were coming back in games consistently, making a tight contest, being competitive, putting together some really strong wins over that back half of the year. And it was because Rodgers was under center. Well, I like him as a college quarterback, as a prospect, I really don't see it. I don't think the arm's there at all. He's a decent athlete, but I don't think he's enough of an athlete to where I'm like, wow, you know, this guy's mobile and he's got this juice. I didn't see it like that. He's small. He has a has an under undersized frame. No, no shaking that. That's going to fall him. He doesn't have the long speed. He doesn't have the arm talent. It kind of leads me to question not only what is his upside as an NFL draft prospect, 
But I do question, is he going to be able to hold off the entire year as the Bears starting quarterback in the ACC when he's going against tough competition and they have someone that is young and intriguing behind him? Yeah, I think it's similar to, to Castellano. I guess not quite the same, but when you look at these guys who are sort of undersized, you know, good college quarterback types, when you're sort of looking at the NFL upside, you, they really need to have something to really sell a team on. And, and I'm not sure that he quite does, you know, like he's a pretty good athlete, can run around a little bit and make some plays with his legs. Um, you know, the arm, there are some nice throws, but it's not really, you know, anything special. And I think those side of guys are just kind of not really going to interest teams that much because there's not too much to be excited about. Rogers is also super old, um, undersized, like you said. So, you know, there's not too much room for him to like blossom into some, some quarterback that a team's going to want to pick with like a fourth round pick or something like that. So I, I can't really see him getting picked, but I think he could be in line for a good year. I think, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know if this job has been completely decided or not. I don't remember. But I think if he wins the job, I don't think he'll lose it because I think he he had a good year at North Texas, and I think he can keep that going even with, you know, more difficult competition here. Um, but, yeah, as an NFL guy, I'm not I'm not quite there unless, you know, there's some huge jump in year seven, I think it is, six maybe, which would be surprising. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see if Mendoza kind of creates some controversy just because he is a young guy that I think flashed, you know, in, in times for the Golden Bears last year. The big thing that works for either one of these quarterbacks, but especially Rodgers right now, is having Jade not in that backfield, being able to depend on the running game. It's going to result in a lot less of you needing to carry the load to where you're asked more to just be efficient and manage the situation while Ott is kind of the centerpiece of that offense. And a guy like Ott is going to produce. You know it because of last year, but it's going to be a tough year for California, especially when they have a schedule that's going to result in a lot of cross-country flights for a lot of their road games. So. Yeah. I'm interested to see what happens with this new look ACC. I mean, we could talk all day about conference restructuring and realignment yeah. and some of these teams ending up in the ACC. It feels wrong to call California the Atlantic Coast conference team, but it, it's the new college football. And I think it's going to be a inconvenient type of scheduling situation when they have to go on the road and travel across the country to go and play teams. Like, you know, I'm just naming someone not necessarily on their schedule, but like if they were to go to Duke or Miami, like they're going all the way across the country and then going against these teams that have like these these momentum building seasons going on to where it's just a tough situation to be in. I'm not sure their schedule exactly, but I, I don't love that aspect for them. Moving on from California to a team on the Atlantic coast, we're talking about Clemson, Cade Klubnick, a guy that was a highly coveted recruit, a guy that was in competition with, Quinn Ewers until Quinn Ewers are classified, a guy that, you know, is, is someone that people really had high expectations for, and he kind of fell flat, kind of fell short of those expectations in, the, in these most recent years. Clemson has sort of taken a step back as a program overall, especially on the offensive side of things. And now the question is, can Kate Klubnick kind of make those next steps, become that next level quarterback that he's been anticipated of being and help the Tigers kind of have a bounce back season? Yeah, I, you know, over the last two years, I've watched a decent amount of Clemson games as a Syracuse fan. You know, I've watched them playoffs. I've watched, you know, just like in passing, I've watched them a few times. And I was never really that impressed with watching. But when I came back and watched the summer, like actually I actually watched it from a from a tape evaluation lens, I was more impressed than I expected to be. Um, you know, I thought I thought his arm was was pretty good. I thought, you know, he's not like an athlete. He's not like a runner, like a, a Rodgers or Cassianos, but you know, he, he can move around a little bit and create for himself. Um, I think the two big things for me that that are really hurting him as far as being a good college quarterback or a good NFL quarterback is, one, he forces the ball a little bit, um, tries to fit into windows that aren't really there. And, two, I think he's just too passive, like, as far as throwing downfield goes. I think he needs to be more aggressive throwing downfield. Like, the arm's pretty good. He's just not really, you know, attacking the, the deep part of the field as much as he probably should. And I think that's making it a little bit easier to box him up and sort of uh, defend that Clemson offense. Um, I, I thought he was, but I thought the arm was good. I thought he was accurate. And, you know, uh, there needs to be a step if he's going to, if he's going to be a serious prospect, but I think it's, it's within the range of possibilities a hundred percent. I think that um, it'll be trickier. You know, it's, it's just tough to, to be the guy following up Trevor Lawrence and, and Deshaun Watson, you know, I guess DJ you on the legway was, between them but um you know it's a school that's been then producing top quarterbacks over the last decade or so 
and he hasn't he hasn't been there and that's tough to uh tough to you know meet expectations there's another guy on this in this conference who has had a similar predicament that we'll get into later so I think that just taking that step I think it's doable and I think if he does you know he can go early um but I think more likely maybe he needs another year but I, I was I was more intrigued than I expected to be so I'm curious to see if they can if they can take a step um next year yeah and you know I I like your point about being a little bit passive when throwing downfield because I wrote down as a comparison for him, Jimmy Garoppolo, who kind of struggled in that regard as well, where you need to be able to kind of bet on yourself and let the play develop a little bit longer so you can take those shots. And I, I felt like there was a lot of plays where Klubnik was taking the check downs and he just didn't have the confidence that you want to see out of a young quarterback. I think it's a lot easier to kind of set up your quarterback to be kind of ready to fire downfield and kind of reel it back rather than taking the guy that's gun shy and you're saying, look, you need to throw down field. You need to make these plays because that type of thing is something that you need to kind of have a, a sixth sense and a knack for just that natural feel. And it's easier to kind of reel it back, kind of get guys more disciplined about making those throws than it is trying to find guys that really need to kind of break that mental barrier to, to where they're making those throws downfield consistently. So it's yeah. an interesting situation. I think club Nick, like you said, Watching during the season, I thought this guy just did not have it at all. Then as I went back and watched, there's a little bit more intrigue. I think there were some nice throws, some nice moments in games where I was like, all right, I, I see the flashes, especially early against Syracuse and Florida State. I thought he had some nice moments of layering passes and making some tight window throws. But now it's about making sure you capitalize on that to where you can make that and be a consistent quarterback where your play is not just like notable and small spurts where you're saying, okay, yeah, there, there's something there. And now it's, yeah. hey, week to week, this is one of our top quarterbacks in college football. This is one of the guys that we need to take at that next level because, I mean, you look at a guy like last year where a lot of QBs got hyped up as draft prospects, but then even guys like Michael Pratt fell all the way to like the seventh round, sixth round, whatever yeah, it was, seven. because it's just, you know, you, you have to be like a high level QB. And Pratt was one of the better quarterbacks in college, but he just wasn't that, that next level. And if you're Cade Klubnick, you have to show a clear next level right now. You have to take a huge step just to be a draftable QB. And if you want to be the quarterback that you've been praised as, as a recruit, you have to be even better than that. So there's a lot of expectation on him, but there's also a lot of necessary gripes because right now he has not been the quarterback he's been promised to be. And a lot of it, I think, is mental. I think he's got to just kind of shake the, shake the like worry and concern and be willing to fire the ball downfield and make those tosses and, hey, Maybe it results in a few more turnovers. Maybe it results in some bad moments, but you got to be confident in that, especially in a Garrett Riley offense that's kind of predicated on being like that vertical attacking system. Max Duggan didn't have like the perfect downfield arm, but he was willing to trust guys like Quentin Johnson to make those plays. And that's what led TCU to having such a strong season in his senior year. Garrett Riley is now at Clemson in a similar offense. I thought it was going to be a great fit for Klubnik, but Klubnik is very gun shy right now. And there's something whether it's mental or whether that's the way he's been coached up or whether that's just what he feels confident in, something needs to change if he wants yeah. to be an NFL quarterback by the end of this year or at least consider it in that prospect type of range. Yeah, completely agree. I think it's a, it's a big year for Clemson. You know, they, they've definitely declined over the last two or three seasons You know, from being a perennial championship contender to just being a very good team. I think this is a big year as well with, you know, Florida State overtook them last year, but they they lost a bunch of guys, you know, to the draft. And uh, Miami, you know, is is looking to take a step up. They were really aggressive in the portal. They've been really aggressive recruiting. Uh, so you know, Clemson, you know, they kept a pretty good portion of their of their program. They're not really utilizing the portal as much as they should be, which you know everyone knows. But um, you know, they they kept most of their key pieces. They lost Will Shipley. They lost Jeremiah Trotter, but. Overall, they've got a lot of good pieces on both sides of the ball. So if Klubnik can take a step, you know, this is a team that can compete for a championship. But, you know, he just needs to take that step and, and be more willing to uh, put the team on his back, sort of, I think. That's going to be a big thing for him. And it's 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 tricky, you know, comparing him to the Clemson of past because he's not throwing to two or three first-round receivers. There's no Sammy Watkins or DeAndre Hopkins or Mike Williams. But, um, you know, he's got some pretty good weapons and Phil Moff is still there in the run game. So I think, I think a big step here makes this team a really serious, uh, contender, but you know, that's a big if. Yeah. And you know, the ACC is wide open. Miami's probably the favorite right now. Florida state's obviously returning with a lot of momentum, but both teams are losing a lot of talent and replacing a lot of starters where 
you never really know what's going to happen in terms of just it all meshing and happening in a season for success. So if Clemson is able to put together some strong play, they could maybe have a great year and be the team that ends up on top in that conference. It's not a given that Miami's just necessarily going to perform to expectations and win the conference or Florida State's just necessarily going to repeat because they brought in some good transfer portal talent. Like there's opportunity for Clemson to end up at the top of this thing come season end. So we'll see how they play. But I mean, a lot of it rides on club. Mix. Yeah, absolutely. So moving forward, we got Duke and that is a Texas transfer Malik Murphy, a guy that came from California to Texas. Now he's heading all the way over to Duke. And I mean, I guess that's just the Atlantic coastal area, you know, California and North Carolina, but <laughs> Malik Murphy's an intriguing guy, great size. I mean, this is a frame that really kind of reminiscent of a can Newton, almost just massive guy with great arm talent and mobility. But the big question is, how is he going to be as a, as a prospect? He got a few starts last year, which I think was huge for his experience, just being able to step in for an injured Quinn Ewers and kind of right the ship. But ultimately, you know, it, it was very rough in terms of just the overall polish and consistency in play. There are moments where you want to see more as an athlete because you know he's got the size and speed, but it's that quickness and acceleration that you don't really see to make him that dual threat that you're kind of looking for. And then as a passer, you know, there's a lot of touch that still needs to be refined. There's a lot of misfires that happen in those limited experience games. Again, solo starts kind of here and there, back to back two starts over the year. You're not going to just completely throw away a quarterback prospect for that, but it is something that needs to be ironed out and worked on if Murphy wants to be a legitimate NFL prospect. Yeah. It, you know, he, I remember two years ago, he had this really strong spring game with Texas and then, you know, played a few games when Ewers was hurt and, and there was a lot of intrigue, a lot of transfer, you know, buzz and he decided to stick it out and then, you know, got some more time last year. And I thought it was a little bit, a little bit rougher. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very intrigued to see how it is as a full-time starter. Um, this is a Duke team that, you know, lost their head coach, lost their, their starting running back, Riley Leonard transferred out. So we're kind of really entering a new era, I guess, of this, of this Duke team. That's been pretty good the last couple of years until obviously last year when Leonard went down. Um, but I, I'm intrigued. I think, you know, like you said, the frame is super ideal. The arm is, is good. You know, I, I was really impressed with his deep ball. Um, maybe it's not consistent quite yet, but I thought, you know, it's a, it's a pretty ball and he can, he can hit it when he hits a spot. It's, it looks like, you know, one of the better ones in the country, I, I would argue. Um, but yeah, the consistency as a passer isn't there. The accuracy is, is got a ways to go. The decision making, the processing is really not there yet. Um, so for those reasons, I would be pretty surprised if he's a guy that we talk about as a 2025 prospect. But I think, you know, if he has a decent year, I will be very interested to see him as a 2026 guy. Um, because, you know, the physical traits are very much there. The flashes, despite the small sample size, have been there. Um, so I'm interested to see how this year goes, um, especially, you know, going away from Texas, where he had a lot of weapons and offensive line talent as disposal to do which is a, a decent team but you know not not texas yeah and i think one thing that is encouraging for murphy from my watch was the byu game compared to the kansas state game i saw a lot more confidence for him as a passer when it came to kansas state that first byu game he was throwing the ball very stiff very timid and it looked like he was more focused on making sure he didn't mess up whereas against kansas state he was more willing to just kind of let that thing roll out and there was a lot more velocity on his throws a lot more zip, and we saw that natural arm kind of come out a little bit more. I think with Duke, as he kind of gets established as a starter and leader of this offense, I think he's going to have an opportunity to get comfortable and make some great plays and showcase those traits. Now it's about making it to where those traits are showcased while still putting together efficient play, which I think he's capable of. I think he's shown a lot of flashes, but again, like you said, he's probably a guy that's more of a 2026 draft type of guy that if he has a strong season, then there's potential where he can put it together for that draft campaign and become a legitimate prospect. But right now, he's very much a ball of play, and I'm just more waiting and seeing on him than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Moving forward, Florida State, a quarterback with plenty of experience. DJ Uyangole, quarterback from Oregon State, transferred to the Seminoles. Seminoles, very big on the transfer portal, making sure they get a lot of talent to replace what was a undefeated team last year outside of the bowl game against Georgia. And they didn't make the playoffs. Now the field is expanded. They're looking to get back and get into that field, maybe prove for some of the guys on that roster that they were capable of being a playoff team last year. Uyangule has a great frame, has some very nice velocity on his throws, 
but there has been some issues in terms of just consistency and steadiness in his play. What were your thoughts when watching? Yeah, I mean, like you said, the frame is is very apparent. The arm is very apparent. Um, you know, the the flash have been there. He was another guy who was a super highly touted recruit um, back at Clemson. You know, didn't really go as well as maybe some had hoped, and he transferred to Oregon State, where I thought he did a, a decent job. Um, he got hurt, I think, during the year, but I think overall he, he played pretty well. They had a good year, um, and now he's at Florida State, and, and I think there's there's some things to be excited about. You know, you got the prototypical frame, like I mentioned, the arm the arm is there. I think the touch is not there when he throws. It's a lot of a lot of zip, but not a lot of touch, and I think that kind of causes problems at times. But I think that's not something that's super like unfixable although he's a bit older so maybe you'd like to see more development there um I think I'm not quite there on him as an early round guy I just don't think that there's going to be enough growth in year I think it's year five I, I would be pretty surprised if um if he develops to that extent but I think a good year you know like makes him solidly draftable um he's a good athlete too I think he, he can do a little run he's not super like laterally athletic but you know he, he's big and strong and and can get going you know like pretty speed wise um so i think there's things to be excited about you know as, as you're like an nfl team i think there's that's kind of the difference between him and some of these other guys like i think that he has something you can sell a team on as far as like physical traits or, or something that's elite he's elite at with his arm um but i, I think there's a lot to go if he's going to be a guy that we're talking about you know in the first two days of the draft yeah, I think what's interesting with Uyunga Lay is I think a lot of his passing mechanics come from the, the upper half of his body. And I think that's where the touch issues kind of come up is the lower body is just not involved in his throwing motion enough. And I think that's a big issue in terms of comfort, in terms of ability to kind of throw off platform. And it results in issues when he's handling pressure. He has some big issues. He's a decent athlete. Like you wouldn't think for someone that is so bad under pressure, he is as nimble and kind of able to make some yards happen with his legs as he is. But it's really just he, he gets stiff in his lower body. And when he's dealt, when he's dealing with pressure, it becomes so apparent that he really just struggles to make throws when it's in traffic or facing a rush. And I think that's where the bigger issues kind of come up in his play. So I want to see him become more comfortable throughout his frame, utilize each part of his frame in his throwing motion. And I think we'd see tremendous strides, at least at the college level, for what he can do as a passer. Again, I'm with you. I'm not as bought in in terms of his overall upside and just ability as a prospect, but I do think that there is nice arm talent and nice frame to where, you know, some teams are going to be intrigued and say, look, I, I want to see what I can make out of this guy. And I do think that there is the upside and development that I think I can see just on paper of what I think needs to happen to where I maybe buy into that development, being able to happen a little bit more, but um, ultimately you know, there, there's a lot of question marks still in his play. And the, that development hasn't happened yet when he has as much experience as he had. So that's the big question mark for Weyong Lele. And I, I want to see it happen, especially for a state where I think he's a big piece of the puzzle for this team if they want to repeat their success uh, this season. But I, I like him. I think he's a good college quarterback. I think he sort of got ridden off after a really rough Clemson start to his career. But like you said, at Oregon State, he kind of bounced back pretty well. He, he was a big part of the Beaver success, especially in that passing game. And now it's trying to replicate that success at Florida State while showing strides to kind of build up his stock as a prospect again. Yeah, I think I think if they, he can lead them to like a playoff appearance type of season, I think that's a big statement because, you know, I mean, it's still obviously a very good roster, but, you know, they lose a running back one, they lose a receiver one, they lose a receiver two. There's a lot of new faces in that team. So it, it's not quite the team we saw last year. They lost a bunch of pieces on defense as well. You know, it, it's it's not – they had a good portal class, like we mentioned, but it's not – it's not as good of a team, in my opinion. I just don't think it is. So if he can kind of carry the load a bit and, and lead this team to, to a, like a 10 or 11 win season and something like that, I think that it probably comes as a result of him playing well, which will which will catch teams' attention. Um, there's a lot of guys, you know, who maybe people don't see as like an elite prospect. You go earlier than expected because they, you know, played really well at, at a winning program like this. And moving forward now to Georgia Tech, Haynes King started out his career at Texas A&M, eventually transferred over to the Yellow Jackets. He's an intriguing QB because, you know, he's got the nice mobility, and I think he has some nice flashes with his arm. I think he is really good and quick and effective when it comes to being a passer that I think helps his game. And Georgia Tech was actually pretty, pretty stingy last year in terms of just overall competition to their opponents. They made some really tough contests for games that maybe a lot of people underestimated them in. 
I'm not sure about him in terms of processing the entire field. I think a lot of his offensive passing is predicated on half field reads, quick routes and RPO type success. So I want to see him develop more as a full field passer, which I don't know happens in a scheme like Georgia Tech's where he's going to be going back into an offense where he has that sort of veteran experience. So you aren't really trying to change it up too much on him. But as a pro prospect, I think that's going to be a big question mark for him. And I think teams are going to kind of test and find out on their own whether they think King is capable of bringing that to the table. Um, Let's see what other notes I had. I I think the arms average. I think he's decent size, but not enough to where it's like you're you're very intrigued. And I think the uh, overall toughness, though, is something that is impressive. I think he's someone that can go into contact, is, is willing to lower the shoulder whenever he's running. And I think that adds on a little bit, you know, that type of toughness is easy to kind of build up momentum for. And also I think it kind of helps the uh, overall appeal for him as a scrambling prospect. Yeah. He was one of the big surprises for me last year. I, I, I thought he was pretty brutal at A&M and, you know, like you said, Georgia Tech had a pretty good year and he was a, he was a big part of that. Um, you know, we, there's a couple other mobile quarterbacks we talked about already. I think King's frame is a lot better, like you mentioned, which makes him a little bit more intriguing in that regard. Um, he's a good runner, you know, they did some option stuff. He was good on, he can scramble. Um, the arm, like you said, I thought was probably average. Um, you know, there's some good plays, but the deep ball, you know, not really there for me as well. I don't think he can really drive it downfield like that. Um, I think the accuracy needs some work still. I think he puts the ball in harm's way a little bit too much as well, which I think kind of makes you a little bit nervous as far as NFL prospect goes. Um, I think that they'll have a pretty decent year. I think he's a good college quarterback. I'm not really sure I'm buying into him really being a guy that you're going to take a draft with a draft pick um, just because I don't think he's quite there as a passer. And I'm not sure I really see the avenue for him to, to take that big step. But I think that Georgia Tech has the opportunity to be pretty good this year. um, And I think King can be a big part of that. Yeah. And I I do like him as a college quarterback. I think there was some intrigue there when he first stepped in for relief of Kellen Mond. I saw some flashes for him but it just did not come forward when he was the starting quarterback. And there were some real questions on if that would happen. Transferred to Georgia Tech. I wasn't really sure what to expect from him, but he, he put together some promising play. And I think he's shown that he's kind of the guy for this offense now, him. And, uh, you know, he he's going to be the leader again. I think that's going to be big for him. Two years is kind of one of the star players of this offense. But ultimately the big question now is how can you kind of take that into – not just being like a stingy team and highly competitive team, but how can you make it into sustained success? Georgia Tech's not going to be underestimated this season. I think a lot of teams are now expecting them to be one of the better ACC opponents that they go against. Can Haynes King kind of go into those rowdy environments, kind of step up and be the leader of this offense and help them kind of overcome those games where they're underdogs against very tough competition? Yeah. For next, we have Louisville, Tyler Shuck, quarterback that started out at Oregon, had some high expectations, some lofty expectations, didn't match them, transferred over to Texas Tech, got injured pretty early, but also got outperformed, didn't really play that well when he stepped in. Now moving to Louisville, this is an interesting situation, but I do think it's similar to Jack Plummer, who was their starter last year, where Plummer started at Purdue, had his issues trying to win the job against Aiden O'Connell, eventually transferred out to California, kind of struggled, went to Louisville and really kind of found his home and found some comfort and became a very promising college quarterback. Wasn't necessarily a huge elevation in his play to where he became a draft prospect, but there was some comfort and, you know, found production that he had as the Cardinals QB. Now Shuck trying to kind of recreate that kind of storyline where he's coming to the Cardinals. I think he has nice size. He has a a similar skill set to Plummer, where I think he is able to kind of maybe have similar type of uh, qualities in that offense as a passer. Uh, I really like Colin Lacey. I think he is a huge transfer for this Cardinals team that I think will be a huge part of that offense and help Shuck have an easier time when it comes to finding production through the air. But uh, overall, I mean, the mechanics are a little wonky. I think they add a lot of time on the throws, which hurts his anticipation as a passer. I think the overall just ability to read and make those uh, accurate throws are, is a big question mark for him. The injuries, of course, are going to be a huge question mark that are going to hold him back in a lot of, you know, just overall ceiling, because even if he has a strong year, people are going to want to see the medicals before they fully buy in. Um, And I think all that combined, it it really kind of creates a heavy red flag for Tyler Shuck when it comes to his NFL projection. Yeah. Like even just ignoring his play on the field, you know, he's going to year seven, hasn't played more than seven games in a season ever. 
and it's turning 25 in September. Like, it's just not really all that together with the question marks about his play. Like, it's tough to really get behind an NFL, an NFL ceiling there. Like, it's going to take like a burrow type season here for, for him to become a serious draft prospect. I think, I, I think I'd be very, very surprised if he ends up getting picked just because there's too many question marks. And I don't think one season at Louisville is going to be enough to answer them unless he, you know, has a ridiculous year with like, 45 50 touchdowns or something crazy which i can't see with how he's played yeah and i think the big thing that bothers me with shucks play right now is you can see the arm talent when he's throwing into the open field you know he has a nice easy opportunity out route he's zipping that ball in there and he's making some great throws but when he's faced through the window a lot of that velocity comes off and it results in incompletions interceptions turnovers bad throws and it's like you got to be like consistent with your delivery to where you're firing that ball in those windows to if you want to slice it through defenders and he struggles to do that and it results in a lot of balls just kind of getting batted down or going down to the ground where you need to be the guy that's kind of making those throws layering passes finding windows and putting the ball in there if you want to consistently produce and right now Chuck just does not have that in his toolbox so it's something that I think just holds him back when it comes to how much I can really covet him as a prospect yeah I agree I think when you talk about Plummer it's, it's a good kind of comparison like I think he could have a good year but I think similarly to Plummer, I don't think he's going to really enter like draft pick conversations. Yeah, I think I'm on the same boat. But some guy that I think is going to enter some draft pick conversations already there, potentially top pick of the draft type of conversation, Cam Ward for Miami, probably one of the more hyped transfer acquisitions of the offseason. Great quarterback from Washington State. One thing that I really liked about what Joel Klatt was saying when talking about it was that at Washington State, Cam Ward was kind of the the main piece of this offense. And when you are like sort of not not necessarily like a solo guy in that unit, but when you're like the, the key piece of whether that offense is functioning, it results in a lot of moments where you're trying to do too much and it can create some of those flaws. But when he goes to a team like Miami where he has Xavier Restrepo, Damian Martinez in the backfield and other weapons surrounding him, it's going to make the job a lot easier. It's going to make him a lot calmer. It's going to make a lot of those forced decisions happen way less. And I'm excited for that with Cam Ward. I think the arm is there, the mobility is there, the size is there. I think the flashes are there to where you see those moments of, you know, efficient play where you can say, okay, if he can unlock this consistently, he is an NFL quarterback. And I think at Miami, he takes that step right now. I think he's probably my bet to be the QB that I'm most confident in to be a first rounder outside of Beck. You know, there's talks about yours, there's talks about Milro. I think Ward's the one that I feel most confident betting on just because I see that touch and consistency when it comes to play enough. Whereas the other guys, they, they've maybe produced at the college level, but that NFL translatable consistency, I think most comes from Ward. I'm really excited to see him. I do think there's issues when it comes to just touch and timing variance. I think that's the big thing for him is getting more efficient in that regard, especially when staying in the pocket, staying in the structure of a play. But right now, I really like what I see out of Ward, and I'm very excited for the Hurricanes because of him. Yeah, I, I think he's in for a big year. Um, I completely agree. I'm very high on him. I think there's a pretty good chance he could be a first round pick. You know, people have been hyping him up for a couple of years now, and, and this is the first time I really like, sat down and watched him, and, and I was very impressed. I thought, I thought, you know, the athleticism's there, the arms there. You know, he'll zip it all over. He's not, he's not like leaving it off. He's really, you know, hitting the windows. He can take some. He can hit with touch when he needs to. Um, you know, can run, can can improvise. You know, I think he does it all, really. Uh, the consistency, maybe not quite there yet. I think there's a lot of hero ball at Wazoo. Uh, like you said, though, you know, at Miami, there will probably be a bit more around him, which will make that maybe not as necessary. I did like his weapons at Washington State. I thought Josh Kelly especially was was really intriguing. He's at Texas Tech now. Um, but I think at Miami, there will be a chance for him to kind of operate in structure a bit more, which I think will be big for his stock because uh, he needs to sort of, chill out sometimes i guess um and and take what's there um but I, yeah i think like i mentioned earlier miami's you know they were aggressive in the portal damian martinez like you mentioned they're they're looking to they're looking to make it the playoffs this year i think ward's got a lot this is last year so you know they're not all in because it's not a good draft where you're getting up picks and stuff but you know they're all in on this year i think uh, a lot of pieces who could be leaving after the season so they're they're looking to win 10 11 games and be a playoff team and maybe win the acc so it'll be interesting how they do. I think Ward's going to have a big year, though. I think he will he will elevate himself into that top tier of quarterbacks, where I have him already, but I think consensus-wise, I think he, he will end up there at the end of the season. 
Yeah, and, and like you said, he's a guy that's been hyped up a lot, but I'm, I'm intrigued to see what happens this year where I really kind of expect him to make those strides. I, I think a lot of people were quick to kind of just assess him as this great prospect just because of the potential and talent that he showcased. But some of it is just now trying to make it happen where you're consistently performing week to week, and I think he's capable of doing that this season. Yeah, I think Miami is, is going to be interesting this year. I think that um, Ward, especially, if he can really put that team on his back, um, he won't need to all the time with Martinez, but, you know, if he can on occasion and, and win some big games for them, I think that the first round is, is well within range for him. Do you think that uh, Hurricanes are, are winning the ACC if you had to, if you had to pick right now? Uh, I think I'm still leaning towards Clemson, but I think that I wouldn't be surprised if Miami does. But I think Clemson, they've got a ton of young talent that I'm really excited to see take another step especially on the defensive side of the ball, that's going to that's gonna be really intriguing to see. Um, and I, like, I, like I mentioned, I do like Club Nick, so I think if he can take a step, that they'll be the, they'll be the team to beat there. Moving on to North Carolina, and they brought in Texas A&M transfer Max Johnson, the lefty, who is 6'6", 230 pounds, fifth-year junior, so he really has another season if he were to stick around in Chapel Hill. But this is an intriguing ad for me because I, I do think that there were some flashes at Texas A&M where he's been expected to be the quarterback that kind of helps this team kind of take those next steps. And he, he's kind of struggled to do so. Um, I didn't love the addition. I felt like they could have gone with a more flashy option for North Carolina, especially with a team that just had a quarterback that was drafted in the top three of the NFL draft. He had, had some flashy play. Mac Brown's been showing that he can recruit on the recruiting trail. I think he could do so in the portal as well. But it seemed like they wanted to go with the experience, kind of get the uh, savvy veteran. And I think they went with Johnson here for that reason. As an NFL prospect, there's a lot of issues in my mind. You know, I think he has some very lopsided mechanics. His base isn't very consistent. I think it results in a lot of inaccurate throws. I think he's got some velocity, but maybe it's just hating on that, like, kind of lefty delivery. But sometimes it just looks, like, way out of whack where it results in some really bad misfires. I don't think he's mobile enough either to kind of sell him either way. And so when you don't really go much in either direction, it results in some really large issues, and I think that's what exists for Max Johnson. Yeah, I, I'm just not really a fan. I don't know. I, I wasn't really impressed in the LSU, nor was I at A&M. I think, you know, he's got the size. The arm is, like, it's fine. There's some nice throws here and there. It's not anything crazy. Um, I don't think he's really a guy who can operate out of structure at a high level, which is is a big deal. I think uh, the processing isn't really there either. I think, um, you know, he's not a guy who can really throw at different angles or – anticipate his throws or layer his passes I think there's just not really enough there for me to be excited about from an NFL lens I think especially going from Drake and Ada Max Max Johnson it's quite a quite a drop up I, I don't like to be too negative but I I wasn't particularly impressed I thought even Wigman who wasn't blown away by I thought there was a big difference between him and Johnson uh when they were playing last season um so I would have liked UNC to be a bit more ambitious you know in the portal here um, so I'm not quite there. I don't think this is an NFL guy. I think, you know, there's, there's enough around that it, he could have a decent year at UNC. I don't want to completely write him off. Um, obviously he's going to be able to re- lean on the run game with Amari and Hampton. And, you know, there, there's some guys, there's some pass catchers around so like Bryson Nesbitt. So, you know, he'll, he'll have some stuff to work with. So if he can take a step and, and fix some mechanical things, then, then maybe, you know, there's some stuff to talk about, but, um, I think at this point in his career, I, I would be a little bit surprised if there was a, a large jump, I guess would be the way I would put it. Yeah, I think if you're counting on some sort of uh, surge in his play, you're kind of looking at him to take that arc of Kyle Trask where you're not necessarily counting on him to be this toolsy passer or this mobile threat, but he's just efficient and able to use his kind of high IQ play and just anticipation to make some nice throws. I don't see that happening for Johnson. I, I do think that Trask was able to make that happen more at Florida than I, I'm, I'm counting on for Johnson to make happen at North Carolina. But it seems like that's the kind of mold that they're trying to follow in. And if you're optimistic about Johnson, then that's probably the path you're looking for him to follow. But I, I do like the weapons surrounding him. Hampton, Nesbitt, McCollum, all guys I really like. Jones is a great receiver as well. You know, there's there's pieces to succeed and for that North Carolina team to have a solid season. But I do question if Johnson's going to be able to hold on to that job and if he's going to kind of help that offense continue to produce at a high level. It wouldn't surprise me if he ends up at his fourth school for his uh, 
what would it be his sixth year at, in college if he ends up you know maybe transferring down to a place where he is the more comfortable starter if someone like Connor Harrell or maybe another transfer option down the road is potentially brought in at North Carolina so not too much optimism around Johnson UDFA grade for me um there's potential there and you know a good season could get him kind of talked about as a later round pick but uh ultimately I don't see a lot of upside compared to some of the other prospects that are um, just all around the country right now. Yep. hundred percent agree. Another guy in the same state, North Carolina state, Grayson McCall, someone that has been in the center of college football headlights for a long time. Thanks to the sort of Cinderella story he had going at coastal Carolina entered the transfer portal last year was probably going to leave, but some of his credits were a little bit misaligned with some of the places he wanted to go to ended up returning to coastal Carolina Spent the year there, maybe had a down year, maybe lost a little bit of stock and a little bit of hype surrounding his name. But now he goes to the Wolf Pack where he's replacing Brennan Armstrong for what could be an intriguing pairing. Uh, he's 6'3, 220 pounds, six year senior. We've seen success happen for him already. So maybe that experience helps him as he jumps to the ACC. I want to see what happens. I think he is a nice mover. He has some solid uh, ish, like solid frames, and I think he's got. Um, just an overall arm talent that doesn't seem just there as an NFL quarterback. I think that that's the big question mark for me is what's he going to do as a downfield passer? I think he has some cool moments. I think uh, there, there's moments on tape where I'm like, okay, I can see this being a good college quarterback. And I think for North Carolina State, that's what they're kind of counting on. But as far as NFL draft specifically, looking at him as a prospect, I just don't see it enough to where I'm buying in in any regard. I mean, there's – not enough velocity on his passes. When he tries to throw downfield, there's big issues. As a mobile runner, I mean, he can make plays happen, but he's not someone that's going to out-athlete anyone. And I think just overall, the anticipation and just ability to go against strong defenses, he too routinely gets taken out of sync and I think has some issues when it comes to reading a defense that just won't work at the NFL level unless he, he takes tremendous strides. Yeah, I think he was similar to Cam Ward in that he's a guy for the last couple of years. He's been that, you know, like underrated or sleeper label from a lot of a lot of fans. Um, and, you know, Jeremy Chadwell leaves Coastal before this last year. He goes to Liberty and and McCall's play drops off pretty substantially. I, I don't think it's the only reason why. I think it might have been a big reason why, um, you know, Chadwell's scheme was was pretty well noted. And I think that McCall was a little bit rely on. It. I think for like you mentioned, the issues reading defenses, I think. Chadwell kind of alleviated a lot of that and it was why McCall was able to play so well. Um, I agree the arm isn't just isn't really there. I think he's pretty accurate, but the processing is is not not there, you know, when he has to really like drop back. Um, you know, he's gotten hurt in each of the last two years and his rushing production has declined over the last three years. So you have to wonder if if he's sort of losing a bit of athleticism from these injuries or, or what's going on there. And I think with all these things together it's it's tough to get excited about him as an NFL guy. I think a couple of years ago, I might have been a little bit more intrigued after his first or second year at Coastal. But at this point in time, I think there's just not enough there physically or mentally to really be, you know, super bought in as a guy who's going to be an NFL quarterback. Yeah, I'm excited to see how he pairs into that um, North Carolina State offense just kind of as a uh, hype guy almost. Not that he's not bringing any talent at the position itself, but – I think that, that he has a nice energy that kind of makes a lot of the offense kind of build on that and kind of succeed in in a, as a result of that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens from a call there with the Wolf Pack. But as far as NFL prospect go, I'm not 100% sold on him at all. Uh, moving forward, though, to Notre Dame, Riley Leonard is a guy that we've heard a lot of intrigue about when it comes to NFL talk. A uh, potential prospect, he went to the Manning Academy and apparently won the quarterback award there. So that's impressive, but obviously not going to – indicate too much for his NFL stock. Still, though, when you watch on tape, I think there is a lot of intrigue, especially in his 2022 season. 2023, he got very battered up with injuries that I think kind of hindered his play, and I think it was pretty evident there that he was throwing out a rhythm, had a lot of inconsistencies that were probably as a result of those injuries. But still, very mobile, very nice size at 6'4", 212 pounds. This is a fourth-year senior that I don't think has any more eligibility left either, and he's someone that I think is going to head into Notre Dame as their quarterback. Again, real quick, we're just doing Notre Dame because they're kind of ACC, so we want to combine some of the notable prospects in here. But this is someone that I, I really could see being someone that kind of takes that next step, especially with a year of confidence as the star ad for this Notre Dame transfer portal class. I think he has the tools as a passer and as a runner to kind of 
check those boxes. It's just there's a little bit more you need in both regards in order to see him take that step as a prospect. And I think that's where the intrigue is kind of there for him in the NFL draft lens because it's like, hey, you know, I see where that growth is needed and he's almost there. So if, if he can take those two kind of half steps in both categories, I'd be really high on him. Yeah, I think a lot of people looking for that step last year and then unfortunately just, you know, struggle with the injuries. I think he could have been a guy who would have been picked pretty early last year had he had he not, you know, gotten hurt and had he been able to take that step. Um, like you said, you know, the frame, the frame is great. You know, he's a great athlete. The arm's pretty good. Um, I like his ability to scramble. I wish he was a little bit better, you know, throwing on the run or off platform type of situations. I think he's not quite the improviser with his arm that you would maybe want to see for a guy who's that athletic. Um, I think the throws are, the throws are all good. You know, the arm's good. He can hit any throw on the field, the consistency, maybe not quite. I think the injuries played a big part in that last year, especially, um, but I mean, he's going to Notre Dame and that's, that's a pretty good situation to be in. So I think, I think, like you said, the step is very, very attainable for him, you know, compared to some of the other guys we've talked about. Um, but yeah, he absolutely has to stay healthy this year. Um, if he wants to, to be seen as a serious prospect, he just has to put together a good healthy season. And if he can do that, I think, you know, the ceiling is, is pretty high for where he can go in the draft. I don't know if I'm going to quite buy in like first round ceiling, but I, I think like he could easily be a day two guy and maybe he could even sneak into the first round, you know, I mean, the size, the athleticism, the arms all there, you know, those are the three things you can't really teach. So I think that there's a good chance that he could, he could jump up a bit if he can stay healthy. Yeah. And, you know, entering an offense with Mike Denbrock, I think is going to be huge for him because we saw what happened with Jaden Daniels, where that downfield passing attack was just so efficient. And I think Leonard has a really nice natural arm. You know, you, Watch some of the clips in the Manning Academy where you're comparing him to guys like Wigman, and you can see Wigman kind of needs those hitches to make those deeper downfield throws, but Leonard's like just there comfortably in his stance, and he's delivering, and he's firing, and he makes some really nice passes. So I think he's someone that's really intriguing, and I think the big thing is now combining that mobility with his passing attack. Like you said, you know, the short to intermediate game when he's on the move is a little bit questionable for a guy who's such a nimble, kind of impressive athlete. So I think you need to find a way to get more consistent and more accurate in that regard to where you're a threat to where if you're on the move now it's, Hey, is he going to kill us with the pass or the run? Not, Oh, he's on the move. Now he's probably going to run or he's going to make a mess like with his throwing. So, you know, that's the big issue is, is can you get that consistency to where you're contributing in all aspects? And then you have your certain areas where you're maybe special at more so than, Oh, you're, you're solid in these aspects and you're weak in those areas because that's where you start to see them start to slip down the board. Um, I wrote down, we talked about him a little bit earlier, but I, I wrote down that tools wise, he, he kind of reminds me of Michael Pratt. So it's kind of hard to assess where I think he falls in this draft specifically because I thought Pratt was a guy that was going to be like probably late day two, maybe early day three type pick. And then he went in the seventh round. So I think that kind of shows the variance of how these quarterbacks are viewed. And I think Leonard could kind of fall in that same kind of bucket where, you know, maybe he's someone that's viewed as a mid round prospect, but then when draft day comes around, he falls down the board a little bit further, but I do think he's kind of in that similar tier, and he's someone that, you know, like we talked about yesterday with guys like Mertz and other quarterbacks, he, he's probably a safe pick, but he's going to be drafted. It's just now what type of range and what type of prospect is he going to be viewed as? Is he someone that's brought in as a cool, reliable backup, or is he someone that's saying, hey, you know, I am the future of this franchise and may even start day one if I'm drafted high enough. So it's going to be intriguing to watch him at Notre Dame. I'm really excited. I think that's a team that – with their schedule and the way that things are set up, I think they have a really good chance of making the playoffs. So he's going to get some chances against some really good defenses. And I'm excited to see how he performs and how he helps this fighting Irish offense kind of take that next step where they've been looking for that impact player at QB for a while. Yeah. I, I like the practice. And I thought Leonard was maybe a bit more physically gifted, but also not quite as far along as a passer, but I think kind of as far as their status, I'm, I'm pretty similar. I also thought Pratt would be kind of like a fourth, fifth round type of guy I was surprised he fell so far um especially with some of the guys who went over him but I think like you said I think he's a pretty safe bet to be picked unless he like gets hurt again if he gets hurt again then it gets a little dicey but if he's healthy like there, there's enough to buy into where I think a team will will want to take a shot because like we talked about earlier like, these guys who are sort of on the fringes I guess of being drafted like you need to have something to sell a team on I think Leonard does with his physical attributes yeah, absolutely. So moving on from Notre Dame, we're going back to the ACC and it's Pittsburgh. Joey Yarnell, not a guy or Nate Yarnell, sorry, 
not a guy that necessarily is uh, as easy to talk about because there's not a lot of tape out there on him. But I watched some of his starts, and, you know, there was some intrigue. He's got a nice 6'6", 205-pound frame, so definitely wants to add weight. But overall, the length is there. He's a fourth-year junior. He has an elongated throwing motion that I think is, is a little bit rough that will kind of result in some issues when it comes to just efficiency, especially in those tight windows. But overall, he has some nice – he, he's definitely inexperienced. You know, I think from the limited starts I saw, there were some very clear flashes of this is a new starter who is still working to kind of familiar, familiarize himself in this offense and in the game of football, uh, college football at least. And I, I think that's something that will come as the year goes along. But overall, I thought Yarnell showed some nice flashes. I think the Panthers are in an interesting year with uh, so much – kind of new surrounding the program. Obviously, there's some veteran pieces, but there's a lot of interchanging parts in that team. And uh, Yarnell is going to be a big part in whether that becomes a disaster season or if they can kind of outperform expectations and maybe put together a quietly pretty impressive campaign. Yeah, the inexperience is a big thing. I think he's only thrown 76 passes through three years, which is which is obviously not a lot. Um, I, I agree with a lot of your assessment of him. I thought there was some interesting stuff, but you know, some stuff that definitely is working on, but it's tough to really tell with such a small sample size. Um, I think because of that and the fact that it'll be his first year as a starter, I would be very surprised if he does not use his fifth year because I think, you know, you have to do real well to to really establish yourself as a prospect, you know, as a first year starter. Um, but I, I think it's interesting. I think Pitt's probably in for a long year, but I think, you know, if he if he does look good, then they could definitely surprise some people and, you know, be a much tougher out than maybe people are expecting. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to hang on to Yarnell too long because I agree with you that this is, this is going to be a guy that's probably returning for another season. But I, I was impressed with how often he was able to go over the middle of the field for such an inexperienced quarterback. And I think that projects well for maybe his overall upside. You know, there's still a lot of projection that is kind of being there for such a limited snaps guy. But there were some nice flashes that I said, hey, you know, that, that's a step in the right direction for if you are – our young QB, you want to see that out of him. Moving forward, though, we're going to talk about Preston Stone for SNU, a QB that, you know, very productive. On on paper, he looks fantastic. You look at his stats and what he's able to do, very intriguing. SNU, of course, coming to the ACC, another team that probably doesn't fit the Atlantic theme, but that's college football for you. Yeah. On tape, though, I, I was a little concerned. I'll be honest. 6'1", 205 pounds, not the greatest frame. But what really bothered me was when he's throwing – his footwork is atrocious. He is so bad at staying on his base, and he almost like flings his lower body back when he's throwing, and it takes so much off of his throws. Obviously, that's not like the craziest thing, and it's not like impossible to fix, but it almost feels like unfair to assess him based on what he's doing right now because his lower body mechanics are so bad right now that it's just like, well, I, who's taught him to throw like this and who has not fixed it? Because if he's able to put up these numbers with like, an inability to stand in and make a throw with like a, a cement base or like a base that's moving forward in his motion. What is there like just this new page for Preston Stone that's going to be like legendary if he fixes his mechanics, or is this just like I don't I don't know. It's a frustrating watch, probably one of the more frustrating because of the talent, but like so many issues that are very easy to see. Yeah, I had a lot of similar notes there. He kind of just falls back when he throws. It, it was very bizarre. Um, like you said, I can't really imagine where that comes from and how it hasn't been corrected at this stage in his career. But, you know, like you said, he was very productive and, and you know, was creating big plays, was not putting the ball in danger, you know, was hitting the intermediate level, uh, which is usually the trickiest, you know, trickiest spot for, for college quarterbacks, which, you know, makes you makes you wonder, like you said, you know, if he can fix that and put a little bit more zip on his passes, you know, what does that, what does that look like for him? Because I think, that's kind of the biggest thing to struggle with is, is hitting tight windows because he's just not getting any velocity on the ball with uh, with his lower half mechanics. So I think I'm intrigued just for that reason, because if he can fix his mechanics, you know, he, he throws with some nice touch and, you know, he can lead his receiver as well. And he's, he's careful with the ball, but can also make big plays. Like there's, there's a lot to be interested from in a production standpoint and, you know, with some of the, some of the mechanical stuff, but, you know, like you said, there's a, there's a lot that needs work. And if, if you can work on that, then maybe there's something to be interested in. But if not, then uh, similar to you, I'm probably going to be a little bit out on that. On his yeah, staff. and he has another year of eligibility, so it could be a situation where he goes to ACC, 
maybe has a solid year but wants to come back another season. I'm kind of expecting that maybe he transfers or maybe stays and and rides it with the Mustangs. But overall, uh, I'm not expecting him to be such a high draft prospect. There's still some intrigue. I gave him a sixth, seventh round grade just because I do think there is something there to be interested in. But I, I want to see some some revamped mechanics to overall try to buy in and, and fully assess them. Moving forward, though, on to Stanford, California team, Atlantic Coast. But a, Ashton Daniels is very intriguing to me. He's someone that I think it, it's weird because mechanically, it's not necessarily a great thing because his mechanics in the NFL have been roasted to no avail. But he kind of reminds me of Justin Fields as a thrower. And I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of their abilities. Ashton Daniels is 6'2", 215 pounds, third-year junior. So this is going to be a young quarterback that I think has a lot of intrigue. I'm not sure on Stanford themselves. I don't I don't know if Stanford's going to be in for a big year, but I think this is a guy with an impressive arm, uh, very good mobility. I think he's very good uh, when it comes to just, like, trying to buy time. I want to see what happens when he is now in his third year, how he handles pressure, because last year when I saw it, there was a lot of issues, especially with just, like, staying in his mechanics, not making some bad throws. But I think that's part of being a young QB that you kind of have to grow through, and Stanford got – absolutely wiped in the transfer portal so i'm not really uh buying into the overall supporting cast there but i think this is going to be someone that maybe isn't necessarily a 2025 draft guy but i think he puts together a pretty impressive season and then we see him i don't want to like say stuff that's like oh i'm encouraging this guy to transfer but i could see him being someone who's like pretty solid year viewed as a top transfer candidate and then goes to like a bigger program, maybe like a Notre Dame or North Carolina or a situation like that, where he finds himself in a better situation to build on a strong 2025 draft cycle campaign to become a top quarterback in the 2026 cycle. Now he's still a long ways to go. It's more just like, Hey, I like the flashes that I see and he's in the right direction, but uh, there's still some movement that I need to see from more polish that I'm looking for. But right now uh, I, I do like what I see out of Daniels. Yeah, I was I was similarly pretty intrigued. I think he's a good athlete, you know, can run around a bit. I think kind of like Leonard, he he doesn't really do as much passing out of structure yet, which I'd like to see him develop a bit. But I thought, you know, he can make a lot of plays with his legs. You know, the arm, the arm's not bad. I thought he could zip the ball around a bit. Um they definitely got hit pretty hard by the portal, but Alec Ayomo Manor is still there, and I thought he was really good last year. Um I don't, I don't even remember who's in their running back room still, but over the last couple of years, I've liked the guys they've had. So they've got one or two of those guys still. Then I think the run game can be solid. Uh, yeah, I, I don't expect him to declare just because of how young he is and how crowded stuff still is with all the COVID guys still kind of filtering through. But I'm I'm interested to see how he does. And I think a transfer up is, is very much within the realm of possibilities if he has a, if he has a solid year. And speaking of a notable transfer, Kyle McCord, I mean, I'll let you take it first because you're the Syracuse fan here. Obviously, we're we're a little split on our opinion of him, but overall, coming from Ohio State, going to Syracuse, big part of this huge transfer haul that they've had for yeah. the Orange. What are your expectations to record both from a college level and NFL draft prospect level? Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit higher on him than most people are. I think he got a lot of stick, which you know some of it was definitely deserved. Like he wasn't he wasn't good enough last year. Um, and you know, he had a lot around him, so there wasn't really a lot of excuse for that, but you know, it, it's tough to follow up five straight years of first round quarterback play when you're not a first round guy, which he's not, you know, like we can be, we can be honest, he's not a first round type of quarterback, but you know, the expectations there are so high that you really have to be performing at like a near Heisman level, you know, because that's what Stroud is doing. That's what Fields is doing. That's what Haskins did. Um, and, and McCord wasn't that, but you know, I mean, Trevion Henderson was hurt for part of the year. Egg was hurt for part of the year. It wasn't it wasn't all all perfect necessarily, even though, you know, it was still easier than 99 percent of the countries or not nine percent of the teams in the country. Um, But like I thought he's a, he's a solid he's a solid college quarterback, you know, in Syracuse. They hit the portal hard. They added some weapons around Gatson's back from his injury. We have a crazy easy schedule. So I think, you know, there's there's an avenue for him to have a really productive year with us. I'm not sure I'm quite there on him, you know, as a, like an elite prospect or anything. I thought his arm was like fine. I thought, you know, he, he has some nice touch with the ball. Maybe he doesn't zip it quite so much. Um, the accuracy is like good, but not great. And, you know, the mobility is not super there, but, you know, he can move around a little bit. I think 
he's just kind of like solid at everything. And I think that's just kind of that bucket of guys who typically like maybe they're late round picks, they're productive enough, but more likely sort of like a priority free agent type of guy. But I think he'll have a good year. I think it, it's a pretty light schedule um, for the orange. And I think that there's some intriguing weapons around him. But Quentin Allen was really good last year as a running back. I think that the run game can be something he can lean on as well. So I think he's a guy that will probably change some people's minds on him throughout the year, just as a college quarterback. But as far as NFL goes, I, I don't think there's anything more than a late round guy there, unless, you know, there's some huge leap that, you know, no one sees coming. Yeah. I think my big thing for McCord in terms of my assessment was even though you obviously want to take advantage of having like your Marvin Harrison Jr. in your offense, I think there were a lot of plays where he was, set on throwing to him and it resulted in some bad reads and when he unglued himself off of one guy and let himself kind of make those decisions i think he showed a lot better promise as a decision maker when the ball was in his hands and when he was reading the defense i think he showed some nice flashes i think the ball placement and just overall ability to send the ball downfield is where it lacks for me and i don't think he's mobile enough to where i'm buying in for him as a prospect really much at all but I do think at Syracuse where he's going to be a little bit more of a centerpiece of the offense they're going to put the trust more on him to make the decision rather than force feeding passes to guys downfield I think that will help him make those steps as a passer at the college level and I think he has the potential to succeed and like you said the the easier schedule is going to help um for me though I I think the big issue is there there's a lot of balls where he tries to send it downfield and he just puts it short and it results in some really bad passes and it results in turnover killing drives that you're you're just not you can't have as a quarterback, especially when you're lying on as a centerpiece of your offense. So it's something that's going to be important for McCord to kind of make those steps is to really kind of showcase how efficient he can be in the short time underneath game. Take those bombs when you have them. Obviously, he's good at trusting his receivers, and I think part of that is is very promising, but you have to be able to mix trusting your receivers with also not forcing the ball into places where you have no business making those types of throws because you just don't have it in your toolbox. Um, ultimately, I think Syracuse has surrounded him with a lot of talent with all the additions they've made. I'm excited to see what happens for the Orange. I think they're heading in the right direction. Uh, now it's just about, you know, can you kind of make those uh, like next steps? You have to actually take them, not just set up the staircase. So I'm excited to see what happens for the Orange, but uh, there's still some work to do for sure. Moving forward, though, a guy that I think is another name we've heard a lot as a potential sleeper for this class, Kyron Drones, quarterback out of Virginia Tech. Great size. He is 6'2", 234, very nimble, very good runner. I think my big issue for him when evaluating was that a lot of the offense was, are we going to send a deep shot downfield or are we going to have this guy run? And there's a little bit that gets taken away when you're a quarterback prospect, and it's kind of just heavy reliance on those two aspects of your game. So I want to see how much he can incorporate the short to in, intermediate parts of the game. Can you throw over the middle of the field? Can you throw with anticipation? Can you find windows and make those throws with efficiency? And I think that's a big part of Jones' skill set and overall game that's going to kind of have to come along. And I don't know if we're going to see it just because Virginia Tech seemed competent with, uh, with that type of system going where they were competing in games and putting up some flashy numbers in some of those contests. But – if you want to kind of take that next step and be able to go into defenses like Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina, and kind of have those strong, balanced outings, you're going to have to incorporate more of the passing game. And I think as a fourth-year junior, you kind of want to see that out of drones, especially where you're relying on him to make a, a larger array of looks as a passer. Yeah, I thought he was similar to Daniels away in a way, just that he's kind of this good athlete, you know, with some with some real intrigue around him. I, I agree. I thought the offense was very simple and, you know, it doesn't really show a lot of like processing ability from him. It was kind of just like you said, deep shot or or take off. Um, and I think, like you said, it needs to be more complex from the really establish himself as a top prospect. Um and I, I, I don't expect it to be like that either. I think they're going to do what works, and what works is is running the ball with Kyron Jones. Um, because like you said, he, he's a really good runner um, and a great athlete and has the frame for it. Uh, so I, I, I kind of think he stays another year um, just because of that. But I think there's something to be intrigued about. You know, if the offense does get more complex and he does well, then, 
you know, there are conversations to be had about him, you know, being a first half of the draft type of guy or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, Virginia Tech's been a team that we've kind of heard as a sleeper for maybe potentially contending in this kind of open ACC. So I'm excited to see what drones can perform with in this offense. And, you know, if he can do well enough to help the Hokies maybe contend for a conference. I don't see it right now, but I think drones is the level of athlete with the level of arm talent and kind of overall toolbox where if he is making those steps in the polish and process kind of uh, aspect, then, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's very much in the cards for this Hokie team. Yeah, absolutely. So moving forward to our last quarterback of the day, and that's Wake Forest, Hank Bachmeyer. Look, I'll be honest, 6'1", 221, decent frame, but overall, I just haven't seen it from Bachmeyer over in his uh, college career. There's been large questions about what he can do and just, uh, just overall as a passer, I think downfield he has really big issues. He doesn't have the overall arm strength to make throws past 20 yards consistently. I don't think he has the mobility to kind of make plays. He, he's got some nice quick decision-making that I think can help him in the short game. I think in that Wake Forest RPO type of offense, he can make some plays. But um, I, I'm not buying into him as an NFL draft prospect yet. That's That's for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. I was not really blown away by his arm. I thought he struggled downfield as well. Uh, not much of a processor and things that, you know, develop more than a couple seconds. He kind of relies on, on the short stuff, which is fine at college. But, you know, in the NFL, it's not really a guy you're going to be betting on. Um, you know, he's already 25, too. So, you know, this isn't a 19-year-old who you can kind of expect to grow. This is this is a guy who probably is what he is at this point. There's no real defining trait here. So I'm just not really that bought in on him being. Uh, much of a prospect i don't think yeah he he's had an interesting career path and yeah he went from Boise state to louisiana tech and now he's here at wake forest it's, it's kind of interesting to see that he transferred up just because it felt like maybe he was going to be stuck in that g5 area but wake yeah. forest wanted him brought him in and it, it'll be interesting you know clausen has a unique offensive style to where he's going to have certain guys that he really makes work in his system so maybe that will be bachmeyer it'll be interesting to watch but overall for his nfl projection i just don't see it for him i am wishing him the best though i, I hope the demon deacons are good because it's fun when they're kind of causing some chaos in college football yeah absolutely well that is all for the acc stick around tomorrow and this week because we have the big 10 and big 12 coming we are very excited for it and we hope that you'll stick around for future weeks for covering other positions but overall i'm michael rockman that's jack donovan and this is the two-minute drill.